Craig Mack ended up in a cult. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And what is it with Bad Boy and these artists becoming religious? Bad Boy in the house. My man Puff Daddy. Man, Craig Mack went to his grave mad at Bad Boy. Come on, we listen to dope. Then we can come up with the rest of the album. No dough, no records. That's it. Uh, Craig on the album. Matt? Yeah. Nah. No. I don't f with Craig. Alright, and the singer of the year is Flavian Year, Craig Mack. Craig Mack! He's close in the house, there he is! Puff didn't like him for whatever reason he didn't. He told Craig, if you don't fire your manager, nigga, you can't work for Bad Boy. Try to do this to somebody, because it was really in my heart to kill him. May 10th. 1970, The Bronx, New York. A kid by the name of Craig Jameson Mack was born in the early hours of May 10th, and while to most, children birth is a cause for celebration, this wasn't the case for Mack. At only 5 months old, Craig was abandoned by his family, who instead of leaving him at the shelter, decided to leave young Mack in the cold streets of the Bronx. Thankfully, he was safely found shortly afterward, and with the kindness of a young family, they decided to adopt him, taking Craig to live with them in Suffolk County, Long Island. There, he managed to stay out of trouble during his early teenage years, alluding it to having a knack for words, and along with Long Island's rap community, he started to get more and more interested in the hip-hop culture. At the young age of 12 years old, Mac started to write some of his first rhymes on paper, and before becoming Craig Mac as we know him today, he first went under the name MC Easy. Inspired by rappers such as LL Cool J and Run DMC, MC Easy had a strong desire to become somebody in this world, and luckily for him, he managed to become friends with a guy who also shared the same vision by the name of Teddy Lee. Teddy, who was an inspiring DJ and went under the name DJ Troop, joined forces with Mac, and together they quickly formed a group called MC Easy and Troop. The duo wasted no time, and at just 17 years old, the group released some of their first singles, Just Rhymin' and Get Retarded, in 1988. The success of the singles was marginal, and despite getting some radio play, the singles eventually flopped. Nevertheless, Mac didn't let a small setback get in his way, and while the duo parted ways shortly afterward, he continued to pursue his dream alone. Just like any aspiring rapper at the time, Mac also participated in rap battles. During one of these, he went head to head with a fellow Long Islander. Eric Sermon, one half of the duo EPMD. The two hit it off, and soon, knowing his strong passion for hip-hop, Eric decided to take him on tour with EPMD. Max started to work as a roadie, helping the group to set up the stage before and after the shows and doing every part of concert production except actually performing music. While it may seem like a step in a different direction, Mac kept his faith and believed that it would eventually lead him somewhere, with EPMD's initial plan being to sign Craig Mac to Hit Squad, which featured Redman, Das Effects, Keith Murray, and K Solo. Unfortunately, before they could do so, the duo ran into problems and eventually parted ways. Now, after two years of touring and without any forward moving in his recording career, Mac was back to square one. Together with his friend, producer, and manager, Alvin Tony, they started sending out demos to various labels around the city, but were met with little to no success. As a last effort, Alvin called up an AR executive from Uptown Records, whom he had known for some time, and told them about Mac. Since they had a good relationship, the AR decided to take a chance and asked him to meet him at the Mecca nightclub in Manhattan. Mac and Alvin got into a cab and arrived at the spot as soon as they could. Tony introduced Mac to the AR at the entrance, who was none other than 24 year old Sean Diddy Combs. As a talent director at Uptown, Diddy was eager to find out if he was really as talented as Hal had told him, so he asked Mac to spit a freestyle. Craig did not disappoint, with Diddy immediately seeing the raw talent that he had. Oh, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, you hooked up with, with Puffy. How'd you hook up with Puffy? I met Puff in the back of a club, you know what I'm saying? Because I was like shopping my demo tape for a long time. I shot my tape for like six years. So if any MCs out there trying to shop their stuff, talking about, you know what I'm saying, determination, the hard work and everything else, keep going, you know what I'm saying? Because you're going to reach your goal. But I, I met Puff in the back of the club, yeah, and I kicked a little freestyle rhyme for him and stuff like that. He was like, yo. Stuff is all that, you know what I'm saying? Why don't you kick a little something with Mary J? 
So we did it like that, you know what I'm saying? The next thing you know, here I was. He wanted to keep Mac close, so he offered him to appear as a feature on Mary J. Blige's song called You Don't Have to Worry. The single was not only his first commercially successful track, but it was also used as the soundtrack to the film Who's the Man, earning him worldwide exposure. Soon after the single, Diddy was fired from Uptown, and with all the skills and talents that he gathered throughout the years at the record label, he decided to launch one of his own, calling it Bad Boy Records. Craig was immediately signed to the label, and he started to work on his first project. While working on his album, Diddy signed another up-and-coming talent from Brooklyn by the name of Notorious B.A.G. He planned to put both Craig and Biggie as the faces of the label since he saw an immense talent and lots of potential in both of them. But before releasing anything, Diddy had to overcome one major obstacle. With his newly formed label, Diddy was looking everywhere to get a good distribution deal and eventually met up with Clive Davis, founder and president of Arista Records. While he wasn't very familiar with Diddy's work, Davis still sat down with him and gave him a chance. I didn't even know that much about Puffy. I did take the meeting, and it was no question that he had the vision that a hip-hop revolution was coming. He needed my expertise to conquer top 40. I was skeptical. So I asked Puffy, what music do you have? He played me Flavor in a Year by Craig Mack. That sold me. The unreleased single by Craig Mack helped Diddy to land a distribution deal reportedly worth 10 to 15 million dollars, thus beginning Bad Boy's era of dominance. The single was something special. While it not only convinced Cliff Davis to make a deal with Diddy, it also quickly became a huge success upon its release. On July 26, 1994, Craig Mack released his first single for his upcoming debut album called Flavor in a Year. The single became a huge hit, peaking at number 9 on the Billboard Hot 100, getting certified platinum, being nominated for a Grammy Award, and becoming the first commercially successful single from Bad Boy Records. You won't be around next year, my rap's too severe, kick it, man, flavor in your head. Initially, Craig didn't like the beat and even refused to work on it, but the immense pressure from Diddy and his vision of it being a hit made him record it. Its success held Bad Boy together enough momentum to finally greenlight his debut album and start its promotion. Before we continue, I just wanted to announce that I recently made a Patreon, so if you want to see Patreon exclusive content, uncensored videos that provide more context, tutorials of how I edit my videos or thumbnails, get an insight of how I write my scripts, or just simply don't mind supporting my channel, make sure to check out the link in the description down below. If not, that's perfectly fine as well. Now, let's continue with the rest of the video. Craig's album was scheduled to be released on September 20th, 1994, exactly one week after Biggie's debut album, Ready to Die. When your album drops on the nation, what can we expect? Okay, the, album, album, the name of the album is called Project Funk the World, and um, it will drop in the third quarter, which is like around September, October. If you haven't heard already, if you've been living in a cave, my name is Craig Mack, like I said, the Flavor in Your Ear is the name of the single that's out now. We got another joint coming out sometime like August or so, you know what I'm saying? But Project Funk the World will be there soon in October, so sit tight for it. Want to drop a little freestyle for the nation? All right, this is a little freestyle for the nation as we get stupid like this. Now watch out now. I get even stupider than the distance of Jupiter when the funk starts scooping you. Plus, boy, got more thought than Johnny Gills, the brother Bills off for MCs catching chills. Mac, power pack. The sound that I stack got the rep for cement crack. It ain't fair, no more, therefore, quarantine, stamped That's on their door. Cool. My punch had a hunch from the crunch of the MCs with lunch on my plate, there's a whole bunch. My stomach would be full, no bull, that much mad rap word pull, cause Craig Mack's king until. I come with this stupid type of bang, that's more black than slang, forgetting everything you bring. From here to Quebec, the high tech, match ah. down on deck, looking for some wreck. Hi, boy. <laughs> we get the delicious fat funk flavor in the house for 9-4. As the two faces of the label, the duo was getting promoted left and right by Diddy, and while on the surface, it seemed like both of them were on good terms, the situation couldn't be any different. Biggie didn't like Craig at all, and in multiple later interviews, after Craig had left the label, claimed that their relationship was strictly due to business and all in accordance with Diddy. And uh, is uh, Craig on the album? Matt? Yeah. No. That's all. <laughs> You can't curse? Yeah, you can curse. <laughs> no, 
Okay. <laughs> While it's hard to say the real reason behind their feud, whether it was something more serious or just purely out of competition, it didn't seem to bother Diddy as he was purely focused on the monetary side of the coin. On September 20th, 1994, Craig Mack released his debut studio album called Project Funk The World. Following the success of his platinum single, the album peaked at number 21 on the Billboard 200 and was quickly certified gold. The album's second single, Get Down also reached the 40, becoming his second hit to reach this accolade and also achieved gold status. The remix version of Flavor in a Year, featuring guest appearances from Busta Rhymes, Rampage, his idol LL Cool J, and Notorious B.I.G., was also a huge hit, only continuing to fuel his success while simultaneously propelling his label mate's album to an even higher position. You're mad cause my style you're admiring Don't be mad, UPS is hiring You see, a week before Craig's album, Biggie released his legendary debut called Ready To Die and its success was massive. The album debuted at number 15 on the Billboard 200 and sold 57,000 copies in the first week of its release. While it took two months for the album to get certified gold, only a year after its original release, the album was certified two times platinum. Singles like Juicy and Big Papa only continued to establish Biggie and Bad Boy Records as a major force to be reckoned with, seemingly overshadowing Craig Mack and the success of his project. Despite being the rapper who initially brought the spotlight and created a platform for not only Bad Boy, but all of its remaining artists, it started to seem that as much as Biggie was growing in popularity, the same way Craig was slowly moving into his shadow. I said this before, if it wasn't for Craig Mack, so, big, you gotta realize Ready to Die was out for six months and it wasn't doing no numbers. When Big got on that remix on Craig Mack's song and he went first on Craig Mack's song, when he did that remix, then it started, it started been looking up for him. But Big from Brooklyn, you understand? If you wasn't from Brooklyn, B really wasn't with you on the for real, for real. Uh, but I noticed like on the remix, Flavor in Your Ear, y'all worked together. That was just something I had to do, you know what I'm saying? Well, that's politics, Puff asked me to do it, yeah. I did it. Oh, I do it. Diddy also seemingly decided to shift more of his focus to Big, which in turn started to cause tensions between him and Craig. These tensions only continued to grow bigger, as for the next album, Diddy had a plan to change the direction of their public personas and paint Craig as more of a ladies man rather than a gritty tough guy. Craig didn't support this idea and was very vocal about not conforming to the current trend and becoming something that he wasn't. Biggie on the other hand didn't have a problem with it and would once again play favorite in Diddy's eyes. On August 3rd, 1995, Craig Mack won a Source Award for Single of the Year, while Biggie managed to snatch four of them. All right, and the Single of the Year is Flavian Year, Craig Mack. Craig Mack! East Coast! East Coast in the house, God bless y'all, word is born. God bless everybody out here who heard my voice last year. And you're gonna hear it this year, 95, and you're gonna hear it every year after that. So peace and God bless everybody out there represented. Show me love. Bad boy in the house, my man Puff Daddy. You know what I'm saying? Four five, my man G. And we out like that. Peace. With Puffs and Mac's relationship deteriorating by the minute, it was harder and harder for them to come to terms with Craig's new project. As tensions between the two were already running high, they further distanced themselves when during one of the interviews, Diddy announced the release of Mac's second studio album without even confirming it with him first. All the different projects, we have big new album that's gonna be dropping in um, like September, Life After Death. Uh -huh. And I wanna be... congratulate Craig Mac on his Grammy nomination. No question. Yes, baby, yeah. Cool, that's cool. And I'm sure you got <laughs> much things in store for my yeah, man Yeah, here. definitely. We got a new album we're working on him to drop in January. Besides that, we're about to just drop our R&B stuff. The Puff Daddy gonna, album. Are we gonna... The surprise in Craig's face only reassured everyone that the inner label problems were more prominent than ever. In fact, 
It would take years before Craig's second studio album would indeed hit the shelves. For Diddy, Biggie's alignment with his vision quickly elevated him to his favorite, and once he struck gold with him, Craig not only became Puff's second priority, but it started to seem that he had no reason to keep him around. If that wasn't enough, things only got rougher as Craig decided to change managers. According to Jeannie Deal, one of Diddy's former bodyguards, this was the final nail in the coffin. When Craig Mack changed his manager, Puff didn't like him for whatever reason he didn't. He told Craig, yo, if you don't fire your manager, nigga, you can't work for bad boy. So Craig was having problems and issues because he refused to fire his manager. He refused to get rid of his, vet, uh, his, his manager, so Puff got rid of him. He told him that. He wasn't going to sign him again if he didn't change management. I got Chris, Craig was loyal to this dude. And they had a real big beef behind that. And Craig wasn't getting rid of his management. I guess the dude had been with him for a long time. So Craig said, yo, listen here, man. I'm not changing my manager just because you want to. Because Craig wanted his money for his music. So Puff said, yo, I don't want that kid no more. Not at all. I, I was right there when he said that. After getting backstabbed by Diddy and dropped from the label, Craig was once again a free agent. With a couple of gold and platinum achievements under his belt, Mag had a pretty impressive resume so far. So once the label executives heard about the news, they immediately started to hit up his line. One of these executives included Death Row Records CEO, Suge Knight. At the peak of West Coast and East Coast tensions, Shook was in the process of establishing a record label in New York, calling it Death Row East, with Eric B appointed as a chairman. Eric B then said that, uh, you know, he picked Craig Mack up and he was going to make Craig Mack the, um, the uh, first artist coming from Death Row East Coast. I said that a long time ago. You understand, Craig Mack was going to be their they first artist. But I knew that Craig Mack was going to sign to Death Row. He was going to be their first artist on Death Row East. He was coming in there with Eric B. Eric B and Big D was going to run that label. You understand what I'm saying? So Craig Mack was going to be their first artist. He was supposed to be performing that night at, I think it's 662? Yeah, Club 662 in Vegas. Yeah, Club 662 in Vegas, the, the, the night Pac got killed. Craig Mack was supposed to be performing at, at that club that night. Craig Mack decided to decline Shook's offer and instead went with Street Life Records. True or false? You were down with Death Row for a minute. False. False. Now, why does everybody think And it's that true? hurt. You know why that hurt? Because I'm trying to, I'm, I'm out here trying to, to get myself together business wise and everything else. And everybody's running around yapping and everything else. So I'm speaking to other people. I'm trying to be a businessman about things. And people were like, oh no, we you know can't mess with you. You that from? I'm like, no, that's not the case. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's not the case. Please don't get caught in rap propaganda. You know what I'm saying? But I met Shug. You know what I'm saying? Shug's a good brother. You know what I'm saying? A lot of people run around saying this and that about him, and he's getting into this and everything else. But I go on what I know from the people how they treat me. Right. You understand right. what I'm saying? And the brother showed me nothing but love and respect. Three years after his last project. On June 24, 1997, Craig released his second studio album called Operation Get Down. The album peaked at number 46 on the Billboard 200 and with its lead single What I Need only reaching 103rd spot on the Billboard 200, the album was soon deemed as a flop, failing to replicate the success of his previous album. The problems for Mac didn't stop there, as soon he was once again a free agent, and this time, the labels were reluctant to take a chance on him. Now listen, how did Big's death affect you? I mean, I know you guys kind of hooked up on the label around the same time, I think, so... Well, Big's death hurt me because, you know what I'm saying, I saw the brother come in the game, you know what I'm saying, and I saw... The, you know what I'm saying, the evolving and the evolution right. of, of Big, you know what I'm saying? And it, it hurt me because here's a brother that got caught up in a lot of things that didn't need to be caught up in, you know what I'm saying? I love him so much, and I feel like I'm still going to see him. You know what I'm saying? Right. right. You know, and that hurt more than anything else. And it's like, you know, I want to say, um, you know what I'm saying, to everybody over there at the Bad Boy family, you know what I'm saying, God bless y'all, you know what I'm saying, and everything else, and, and my soul and my heart is with y'all, you know what I'm saying? 
Now, did um, you foresee a lot of times? You yeah, know, you, you, you yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, did I want it to be my man big? No. Did I want it to be pop? No. But did I see it? Yeah, I saw it. You know what I'm saying? And I, I saw it because I saw the way it was headed. You know what I'm saying? I mean, everybody with a little premonition saw what was about to, about to happen. Right, you know what I'm saying? Right. For the next couple of years, Craig found himself wondering in uncertainty about the future of his career. And as the years went by, his momentum only continued to fade away. Three years later, Mac released two singles, The Wooden Horse and Mac Come Through. But unfortunately, both of the tracks came and went unnoticed. On February 25th, 2002, five years after his last album, Craig made a special appearance on Diddy's single called I Need a Girl Part 1. The duo seemed to be back on good terms, with Mac during one of the interviews with MTV claiming that he was in the works on his third studio album and all the bad blood was behind him. I don't regret leaving the label, I'm just glad that I'm with my family. What happened in 94 and 95 happened in 94 and 95, and it must have happened for a reason. So to see everything come back together now is just a good thing and a blessing. I'm getting ready to go to the studio next week, making sure this album and everything is ready. Unfortunately, these claims about the album would once again amount to mere talk, as it never saw the light of day. The reunion with Diddy was yet another bust, and after being done dirty so many times, it's hard to say what was going through Craig's mind. After all, he was the one who brought the spotlight and was a big part of Bad Boy Records' initial success, but yet he was the one who was struggling the most. Craig stayed silent for the next four years, when suddenly, after almost 10 years since his last album, Mac released a couple of singles called Mac Tonight and together slash I'll spend that. The release was yet another bust and after receiving no recognition, Craig Mac completely disappeared from the spotlight. I received an email this morning. Remember I told you, Craig Mack? Yeah. Amen. You people out there listening to me? Craig Mack, you know, when he first came around, he really didn't want anybody to know where he was. Right, right. Well, I'll tell you, boy, it is now hit, what do they call that, Wicked Pig? Wicked Pig. Brother Stare, I saw up on Wikipedia that Craig Mack has joined the Overcome Ministry. Yeah. Is that true? In 2012, Six years after his last public appearance, a video was uploaded to YouTube by a user named TLink79, which featured Craig Mack, revealing to everyone that during his absence from the public eye, he joined a Christian ministry in Walterboro, South Carolina. What is your name, sir? My name is Craig Mack. And uh, uh, what did you used to do when you was in the world? Wickedness. Wickedness. <laughs> oh, okay. And what are you doing now? Righteousness. Whoa, hallelujah. Oh, my God. So you see? He purchased property within the community compound and became a full-time resident. Max stated that he had escaped the wickedness of New York and was now devoted to doing God's work in South Carolina, completely dedicating himself to God. The community that he was living in consisted of around 70 people who had to follow certain rules, including never leaving the compound premises and to object every medical or any kind of intervention from the outside doctors. The residents were always reminded that they could leave any time they wanted and no one was forced to stay there. Many started to speculate that the ministry was just a cover-up for a cult, especially since its leader was a pretty strange person. Well, not only did his made-up rules confine all the community members in one place, giving all the power to him, but over the years he was involved in countless amounts of controversies and legal troubles, including sexual abuse, kidnapping, burglary, assault with intent to commit sexual misconduct, criminal sexual assault with a minor, and many, many more. The victims often described him as manipulative and forcing his religious slash personal beliefs on them, telling the women that his acts were God's will. He broadcasted his recorded programs to YouTube, and on one of which, he was caught touching a 12-year-old girl's breast during service and then proceeded to say, I'm gonna touch them things till nobody else can touch them. Despite secluding himself from the public, Max still had a lot of love for hip-hop and in 2017, after multiple years of absence, he released an album called The Max World Sessions featuring 18 previously unreleased tracks recorded from 2001 to 2006. 
Unfortunately, this complete seclusion from the outside world would also go against his health, as he was seemingly starting to develop heart disease. He suffered from shortness of breath, started to use a cane to help him walk, and according to Eric's sermon, he even started to daze off while talking. So he called all his friends that he went to school with, you know, me, Alvin, my boy Bernard, Lenny, um, Bismarcky, um, he called a few of us. So we kind of knew what was going on. He only had 25% of his heart that was, you know, he was using. And um, when you would talk to him on the phone, he would kind of like, you know, days off for like 10 minutes at a time to catch his breath sometimes. And then he would come back to the phone. The illness eventually caught up with him. And on March 12, 2018, at only 47 years old, Craig Jamison Mack was pronounced dead after suffering heart failure at a hospital near his home in Walterboro, South Carolina. Many famous people took to social media to say their final goodbyes to the late rapper, which also included Diddy, who wrote, You were the first artist to release music on Bad Boy and gave us our first hit. You always followed your heart and you had an energy that was out of this world. You believed in me and you believed in Bad Boy. I will never forget what you did for hip hop. You inspired me and will continue to inspire us. We will always love you. It was reported that Diddy offered his help to pay for Mac's funeral, but the religious community respectfully declined his offer. In an interview years later, Genie Deal revealed that they declined the offer because that's what Craig told them to do after he passed. Man, Craig Mac went to his grave mad at bad boy. Craig Mac told his people, told those religious people that don't let them pay for a mines. I don't want them to pay for nothing in my death. Following the rules of the community, no colleagues or friends of Max were allowed to attend his funeral, and he was ultimately buried on the property where he lived. A year before his death, Craig invited Alvin Tony, a former manager and the person who introduced him to Diddy, to his home in South Carolina, and together they filmed this last interview. During it, Craig revealed that before joining the religious community, he contemplated about killing an undisclosed person who was doing him dirty in the music industry, owed him money, and seemingly even threatened him. Many rumored that this person was none other than P. Diddy himself. I got with somebody, you know what I'm saying, I'm not gonna say their names, I'm just gonna say somebody that wanted to do another album with me. So I said, cool, I, go, I gave him my price, and the price was, to me, it was low. You know, and he was supposed to give me the money. And I go in the studio and I start banging out. So he came to me and was like, yo, I can only cut you a third of the money I'm supposed to give you. I said, you know what, man, I want to do these songs. You know what I'm saying? If you're going to do this and that a third, let's do it. You give me the money as we go. You know what I'm saying? I'll take a third again. I'll take a third again when we finish the actual recording of the album. Nothing happened. No money. So I stopped recording. I said, I'm not going to be a, you know, an idiot and sit here and do all this stuff for everybody. And I'm not going to see anything from it. You know, next thing I know, money come, you know, with this, with this, this bullish mafia mentality with him and his goons and all that stuff like that. You know, talking about, yo, you know, you owe us an album. And I'm like, excuse my friends, but I don't owe you. You owe me money. You know what I'm saying? So if you can come over the rest of this dough, then we can come up with the rest of the album. No dough, no records. That's it. I don't think you know what you mean when you're saying that, man. You know what I'm saying? You know what type of dude I am. You know what kind of muscle I got. You know what I'm saying? Right now, you need to be in the studio. So I said, all right, meet me up there at 7 o'clock. And I went and got one of my gunmen. My man, um, I'm not going to mention his name either. He came with me up there. Okay? And they saw him. And they fell back because they were going to do something to me. But they didn't. So we talked about it, you know, it came to definite. Look, no cash, no record. I'm not going to be sitting here going in the studio all night, every night, busting my ass. And I ain't seeing nothing from it. I caught a couple of threats, a couple of, you know, passes by in the street and everything else. I caught a couple of threats. And I was sitting there uh, going to pick up my sister from work. And I'm in her car. I'm driving her car to go pick her up from work. And I just was sitting in the chair, and I was like, God, I'm so tired. I had a gun in my lap. 
And I'm sitting there, and I'm talking to God. I'm like, Lord, I don't want to do this. But if it comes to getting ugly where somebody's going to be trying to kill me, I'm going to have to do something first or do something to prevent that from happening. You know what I'm saying? And I was like, I'm frustrated. I'm, I really need your advice and your love right now. And I started flipping around the radio station. And when I turned the station, all this gospel music came on. And it was this song I've never heard before in my life ever, but I knew that it was God talking to me. You know what I'm saying? Because of the way it made me feel emotionally. I broke down, started crying all over the place in the car. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I was thinking about trying to do this to somebody because it was really in my heart to kill him. Unfortunately, Craig's life was filled with lots of ups and downs. And like many bad boy artists, he fell victim to the P. Diddy curse. Rest in peace, Craig Jameson Mack.